Hello, shalom, everyone. God has, can you hear me okay? I have the microphone way over there. Okay. God has good news for you. And we're going to share it today right from God's wonderful, omnipotent word. Everybody say, wow. Wow. Thank you, Grady. But, um, you know, this is the wow word. But also we need to watch our words. That's W-O-W as well. Watch our words. Because we want to say wow words. We want to say the words of the Lord, you know. We don't want to say anything else. I don't want to mix the profane with the sacred. So his words are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. This book is holy. It's different than other books because it's got God's word in it. Any book that has God's word in it, God speaking, that's a holy book. People that aren't born again won't understand it. But it speaks to our spirit. That's where it is. So we're going to have a good meal for our spirit today. So let's share a screen. But, you know, is you can always tell immediately who loves God. The spark is there. Do you know what I'm talking about? The spark is there. It's not just uh, this is duty, this is obligation or whatever, but the spark is there. Um, that's the same, you know, when people have first love or they get married, the spark is there. And God says, keep that first love, keep that spark there. What does he tell Timothy? Fan that fire into flame. Remember last week we were talking about sacred fire, you know, fan that fire into flame, right? And so that fire in our heart is lit with the Holy Spirit and with that love. That's the fire. That's the love. Because love is, is uh, what does it say? It's, it's stronger than death. It's a flame of fire. You know, and his eyes are flame of fire, it says. That's that love that's just will consume everything else that's dross that's not good out of you and put you as solid go. So let's take a look at the, uh, I want to share screen. So here we are. Share. And I'm already on the end. I speak the end from the beginning, right? So let's put it up to the top. Uh, let me see. There's people in the waiting room. Let me let them in. Oh, there we go. Good. All right. So I'll just put that meeting down there. So we're on Psalm 91. And we got yeah, Leslie is the first one on. So Leslie, you probably have this memorized by now. But will you read us Psalm 91? We all got to get in the secret place. We all got to get in perfect protection. We all want to abide with him. So that a thousand fall at one side, 10,000 at the other. But it doesn't come near us. Kind of like Noah in the ark, right? Uh, we want to just be in that secret place with God at every moment, at every moment, every moment, you know, we want to be there. So, um, Leslie, go ahead. Okay. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and I abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For he delivers me from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He covers me with his pinions, and under his wings I find refuge. His truth is a shield and bulwark. I will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. I will only look with my eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because I have made the Lord my dwelling place, the most high my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall me. No plague come near my tent for he commands his angels concerning me to guard me in all my ways. On their hands, they bear me up lest I strike my foot against a stone. I tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent I trample underfoot. Because you cling to me in love, says the Lord. I deliver you, I protect you because you know my name. When you call to me, I answer you. I am with you in trouble. I rescue you and honor you. With long life, I satisfy you and show you my salvation, Yeshua. Thank you, Leslie. Beautifully read. And 
such wonderful promises and scripture from God. We know all his promises are yes to us in Jesus. And he's never anything but yes. So, but we have a part here too. We need to dwell in the secret place. And you remember he said, if you love me, you keep my word. And my father will love you and will come to you and make our dwelling place with you. And we abide in the shadow. We're so close. We draw close to God and he draws close to us. He's El Shaddai, Shaddai here, Almighty. That's, he's more than enough. He's, everything we need is in him. And he delivers it to us through others, through people, through work, through situations, but it's all from him. That's good. Every good thing given and every perfect gift, it says, don't be deceived. Every good thing comes from God. Bad things don't come from him. So we need to rebuke them. And we need to take him as our safe place and our strong place. My refuge and my fortress, we need to trust. Now, how can you trust God when you know and believe in the love he has for you? And you've seen what he did for you in Jesus and what he's done in giving you life. Wow. You don't have to be even ruffled, you know, in any circumstance. You don't have to get shaken up. You can just be like Paul. You know, he'd been through a shipwreck. He's on the island of Malta. He's bringing the brushwood over and he gets bit by a very poisonous snake. Now, most people would have said, this is not a good day. Just a shipwreck. But no, what did he do? He just shook it right off and continued on being grateful to God that God is going to said, I'll save everybody on the ship, but the ship will be lost because you're on there, Paul. And I'm making sure you get to Rome to witness. And he thought, no snake going to stop me. He just shook it off. And he said, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. And I thought, that's it. You can either get all shook up when something happens that the devil throws you away, or you can shake it off. And I think we all prefer to shake it off, right? Just shake it off and go on. Because what does he say here? It won't come near you. You can tread on that lion and the adder and the young lion. You just walk over them. How do you walk over them? Easy. You say, oh, no, you don't. I've got a healer. I've got a provider. And he he loves me. And he takes care of me. And I have nothing to fear. And, uh, you know, when something goes wrong and all of a sudden your buddy or whatever, you just say, no, no, wait a minute. I don't fear. He gave me the promise of healing. He gave me the promise of renewing my youth. And those promises are all yes to me. I don't need to get shaken up about this. I just need to speak to it. And you know what? That's right now. I did that a couple of times this week. And I thought, thank you, Lord, that you've taught us that. That I could just answer it. And away it went. And uh, I didn't have to get agitated. I didn't have to go into yelling and screaming. I just was very simple. Like Jesus, quiet, be still. You know, stop that. No, you don't. Quiet. You know, say, Satan, close your mouth. So, and be gone. Open my ears that I may hear. Open my eyes that I may see. Open my heart. Oh, Lord, to hear your voice. That's it. We got to be listening all the time. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Your servant I will be. To do your will is my delight. Right now, say, Papa, Abba, to do your will is my delight. Just show me the way. Let me lean on you. You're not my own understanding but on what you're showing me. Because, you know, he got questions about things. Anything, just ask him and let him show you. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. Your servant I will be. For to do your will, O oh Lord, is my delight. It is a delight. He rewards those who seek him, you know. And faith is the, the law of faith, it talks about that's the law of the kingdom. That's how you get everything in the kingdom. Grace makes it, but faith has to take it. So, um, Grady, would you read us the next two, uh, well, all three scriptures? These are your specialty now. <laughs> For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son, that I who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son to me to judge me, 
but that I might be saved through him. John 3, 16, 17. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Isaiah 55, 12. Thank you, Grady. You know, if we learned these three things today, we'd be way ahead. It would just make our life wonderful. You know, God so loves me that he gave his only begotten son that I who believe in him, there's the requirement, believe in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send him to judge me, save me. And the same, what's our job? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, everything give thanks. You know, you can do that. I know it's a little bit hard when things all seem to be going wrong during the day, but you rejoice that God's going to take care of it, that you can cast all your cares on him and he cares for it, and that he always gives you a way out. But how is that way out? You got to go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Well, joy, Psalm 105, 43, it says he led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt with joyful shouting and singing. That's the way he led them out. That's the way we got to get out of stuff too. As Paul and Silas knew it, they're chained to the floor in the innermost prison. They've been beat with rods. And what were they doing? Singing praise. And every chain fell off and all the gates opened. Now, most people would not have been singing praise at that point. They would have been asking God, why did this happen to me who am doing your work? No, they were singing praise. And Paul said, you know, I consider a great honor that I'm getting persecution for the faith. Because I used to persecute people who believed, and now I'm on the other end. And I'm, he actually said he was running over with joy to be doing something for the Lord rather than against him, and that God had considered him worthy to switch places and have everlasting life, even showed him heaven, the third heaven where God dwells. And he said, I can't even begin to describe to you what I saw there. So we are so blessed that we have the Bible and can read about these things, and God can show them to us too. And always be consulting him, always be listening to him, that's praying without ceasing. Don't go even a moment without getting his input because then we're going to get the wrong kind of output out of us. And in everything, give thanks. Be so grateful that you have the gift of life. Cherish it. He didn't have to give it to you, but he's given it to you for eternity. All are alive for him. And, uh, you know, this is a very wonderful thing. Now, since today is Father's Day, <laughs> we're going to sing that prayer to the Father, yeah? Our Father, oh loving Father, I come to you through Jesus, my brother, my brother, boldly to your throne. And I say, hallowed, almost holy, be your precious name. A strong tower, a mighty savior, there's power in your name. So here, you know, hallowed be your name. Start thinking about the names. He's Yahava Rofeka. He's the Lord, your healer. That's a good thing to know. You're going to probably need it today. Even. And Yahava Sikhanu. He's the Lord, your righteousness. You don't have to have your own righteousness. It's his. And he's, there's no unrighteousness in him at all. It never changes. And he's Yahava Simhat Gali, the God of your gladness and great joy. And he's Yahava, his key. She, he's your strength. Roi, your shepherd. Shalom, he's peace. Yure, he looks ahead and provides. Makadeshem, he sanctifies you and makes you holy. Wow. These are such wonderful names, and they're all fulfilled in Jesus. But I like he's a he's your strength and your song. Oh, that's repeated three times in the Old Testament. God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, my Yeshua. Yeah. So, and I say, your kingdom come, and I say, your will be done on earth as it is in that 
vast and glorious great kingdom of heaven heaven that great kingdom of heaven and give us this day our daily bread with you as our shepherd we shall be well fed and forgive us o loving father for all the wrong that we have done just as we forgive all others just as you forgave us in your son and lead us not into temptation don't let us even enter that way but deliver us from all evil and keep us safe all the day for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forevermore amen amen and i say it again amen 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 everybody say it. Uh. amen yeah we believe in all of that we want his kingdom to come and his will to be done his will is healing his will is uh blessing his will he blessed man from the start he can't do anything but bless you know, you get close to God, all you can do is get blessed. This is amazing. So let's sing. You know, Jesus said he came and he brought Jubilee. He opened that scroll and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, we know it. Melchizedek anointed him to be a priest for, a, you know, and the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. What does he anoint us with? The oil of joy. He tells us that in the Old and the New Testament, that he uh, anoints the Messiah with the oil of joy. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. Can't but be helped, but be full of joy in the Holy Spirit. And it's one of the fruit of the Spirit, love. You know, joy. Got joy, peace, got patience. But kindness, faithfulness, gentleness. You know, all of these wonderful fruit that he produces in us when we attach to him like the branch to the vine. Yeah. So that Jubilee, what was happened in Jubilee? Well, he said, I brought a year of favor, Jubilee, from the Lord. And it's the whole still that period, the grace period. It's still Jubilee. What's that happens at Jubilee? All your debts are forgiven. They're paid in full. So he's take our debt. We owed the father, you know, all I have and all I own could not pay my debt at your throne. I mean, when we sin, we owe it a debt to God. We owed the eternal life we lost and we couldn't pay it. And Jesus paid it for us. So he nailed it to the cross and paid it for us, you know. He paid all our debts. He restores, restores all everything you lost. Everything you lost, he restores in Jubilee. Wow. So we've got repent, return, rejoice, restore, and get filled with the Holy Spirit, right? That's from Joel, the prophecy he talked about at Pentecost. Yeah. Those are the steps. So Jubilee, Jubilee, it's a year of Jubilee. Jubilee. Okay, you can pick this up pretty fast. Everybody be singing even though your mic's off. Because to get in his presence, you need to get up there. You need to sing some. Jubilee. He's enthroned on our praises, right? Jubilee, Jubilee, for our God has set us free. Jubilee, Jubilee, it's my time of Jubilee, a year of favor from the Lord. Sound the trumpet, give the shout for the good things God's about. He brings blessing and brings peace, so we prosper and increase. To do his will is my delight, for he makes my future bright. So I raise my voice in praise. Everybody raise your voice in praise now. Jubilee, say, say it, you got to believe it and get it. Jubilee, jubilee, it's a year of jubilee. Jubilee, jubilee, for our God has set us free. Jubilee, jubilee, it's my time of jubilee, a year of favor from the Lord. He is kindness, he is love, he pours treasures from above. He is goodness, he is praise, he will bless me all my days. Everybody say that, he will bless me all my days. He's our father, yep, he's our Lord, and he brings a great reward. So I raise my voice in praise. Remember he told Abraham, I'm your great reward. Jubilee, I can't think of a better one. He's everything. Jubilee, jubilee. It's a year of jubilee. Jubilee, jubilee. For our God has set us free. Jubilee, jubilee. 
It's my time of jubilee. Say that. It's your time. It's my time. I'm getting restoration. A year of favor from the Lord. He has given us his son. Put the devil on the run. All I lost he has brought back. In my future there's no lack. He brings healing. He brings grace. He redeemed the human race. So I raised my voice in praise. Yeah, think of that. He put the devil on the run. What's it say? You resist, you submit to God. You get his word in your mouth, you resist the devil. And what's he got to do? He got to flee. He got to run. That's what it says in the Greek. He got to run fast. Are you going to squash it? Checkmate. But uh, put the devil on the run. So we put him on the run. Jubilee, jubilee. It's a year of jubilee. Jubilee, jubilee. For our God has set us free. Jubilee, jubilee, it's my time. Everybody say, my time of jubilee, a year of favor from the Lord. If there's children in your family or whatever, they're away from the Lord, say, it's jubilee. This is my time of jubilee. They're all coming back. The first Adam made us fall, but Lord Jesus regained all. He has given back to me all earthly authority. He's the victim. He's the priest. We're invited to his feast. Remember, he invited us to the marriage feast of the son, but nobody was coming. We're going to go. So I raise my voice in praise. Everybody sing it. Jubilee, jubilee. It's a year of jubilee. Jubilee, jubilee. For he died to set me free. Jubilee, jubilee. It's my time of jubilee, a year of favor from the Lord. So every day, a year of favor from the Lord. So what's this year? The year of favor. We are beloved. We are forgiven. We are blessed and we are favored. That's the story of our life. Now, one of the most extraordinary statements in the Bible is right here. God is love. Not just he has it. Not just he gives it. He is it. What does that mean? Nothing else enters him. He thinks in love. He talks in love. He walks in love. What do you think his kingdom is? Love. What do you think his word is? He is his word. Love. That is a love gift to you, the word of God. And, and it's an opportunity to have all the blessings by obeying it, right? Um, everything he does is love. So he only does good things. Love heals. Love blesses to prosper. Love provides. Love multiplies loaves of fishes and bread. <laughs> you know, love, love sees to things for you. Now, I, I, I was thinking about this. You know, down the ages, people have tried to invent God, right? You probably all read the Greek myths. You read different stuff. They to, they try to define God. They try to make idols of everything from wood to ornate gales, silver, precious gems, bow to them as God, make temples to them, shrines to them. This is this God, that God, this God. Somebody said, well, they went to Indian. That was like this God over here, this God over there, this God, and there was the shrines. And um, invent doctrines, myths, and tales about God. But I'm going to tell you this. No one ever even came close to telling us who God really is. What is he? Let him define himself. He's love. If you look at the gods people invent, they're not loving gods. They're cruel. They are. Just read the Greek myths. Just read the stuff. They're cruel. And if you don't do exactly what they want, guess what? <laughs> Boom. You know, they're they're cruel. And you got to remember, they sacrificed their kids. They slashed themselves for Baal. You know, it, but God's love. What do you say? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I carry it for you. He says, you're my burden since your birth. I carry you through to old age. Now, Paul prayed we'd understand this. So, um, would you read for us, Ellen, Ellen, for this reason, I bow my knees. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth 
to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Thank you, Ellen. That's a wild prayer, isn't it? That's a wild prayer. It's like, oh, wow. What Paul was praying for us was powerful. He's like, get full of that. Get full of the spirit. Get full of Christ. Get full of the love of God. And you're going to be like God. You're going to enjoy that flow of heaven, that blessing where things do not pull you down. You pull them up to your level. So God defines himself as love. And he tells us he pours his love in our heart by the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's he telling us? He's pouring himself. Yes, we become a sanctuary, a house of God, a gate of heaven, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We're made entirely new, like we were talking about last week, being a new creation. Not a remake, not a remodel. You're new. So he heals you and blesses you. By the hands, he reaches out to you in the gift of his son, Jesus. So we're looking here at the Trinity. You know, he shares his thoughts and power with you by the spirit, his spirit. He places you in himself as one in him, in Jesus, through that Jesus making you holy and blameless. He reconciles you to himself in Jesus and births you as a new creation in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. In you and on you, your regeneration in the word by the Spirit. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing through, though God, you're seeing, though God is three person, he's inseparable as one. And he's working in you and the work being done for you and in you, that's who the Trinity is for, to reach out and do a work in you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together as one, but not complete. What's going on in you is not complete without the three, but it really all comes down to one. In the end, your life on earth, all that matters is what you did for your audience one because it explains to it, it all comes back to the Father. The Holy Spirit and the Son proceed from the Father and they draw us back into the Father. They're sent out to pull us back in. Grace upon grace, like the waves of the ocean, they go out and they pull it back in to that unfathomable ocean of love. They go out and they pull us back in. And that's what he said when he called his disciples to be with him and then to go out and preach and to pull people back in, to go out and the grace and pull them back in so that we're all become one with our father for eternity in this glorious kingdom. And uh, when you look in the book of Revelation, all they can do, the ones that are there is keep praising God and praising the lamb and praising the spirit and just praising that they're there. So aren't we so grateful that we have the opportunity of life and to be in this, if we pass the test here, to be entrusted with heaven forever. Because if he can trust us with little things, he can trust us with greater. So be faithful in all little things. Watch the lies. Watch your thoughts. We're going to talk about that today in a beautiful way. So would you read this for us? Um, let me see. Ruth. All things are subjected to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Corinthians, I'm sorry, I don't know how Very to good. pronounce it. Very good, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15, chapter 15, 20, uh, verse 28. Beautifully read, Ruth. Your English is beautiful. And we see here that pulling everything into one in God, that kingdom of oneness. It's so beautiful. So three in one, but how can we understand this? I remember once I was like talking to God and he said, well, water is H2O no matter what. It's got the same composition. But look at the three distinct forms. There's ice, there's flowing water, and there's steam. But at the same temperature, all the water's the same. But the father always takes the lead and all life comes out of him and returns to him. All are alive to him. Isn't this wonderful? 
that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You say, well, they died a long time ago. Yeah, but they're with him. <laughs> and to the, them, him, they're not dead at all. They're very much in his kingdom. And um, w w would you read this for us, um, Annalyn, but the, that the dead are raised? Let's see, I saw Annalyn come in, but I'm wondering if she can read. How about Mitsuko? But the dead are raised. Even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all are alive to him. Luke twenty thirty seven to 38. Thank you, Matsuko. Beautifully read. And isn't this a beautiful answer to people that say, well, you die and that's it? No, <laughs> it's not. And we go before him and it, it says we render an account to him of what we've done in the body. So the son proceeds from the father and the spirit proceeds from the father, but also is called the spirit of the son as one. But Jesus, God's son, had to get us the promise of the spirit by dying and giving, uh, paying the father the eternal life we lost in his flesh. He had eternal life because he was born from above by the word, just like Adam was when Adam lost it by changing the seed that was in him from the incorruptible seed of the word to the corruptible seed of lies. And that will, lies will not last, they will perish. And that's what he did to the seed. But you know, God is so good. If you if you look in the beginning, when he made man, he's giving us dominion over the earth, but how did he give us dominion? You just read it right there, he gave them the seed. Because you see, without the seed, every time you wanted a new tree, you would have had to ask God to create it. But once he created things and put seed in them, you can grow them. You can grow them. And seed in the person and the man, you can you can create life, the man and the woman. You see, suddenly he gave us the ability to have that dominion through the seed. So do you see why the and the biggest seed he gave them was he planted his word in them. And the word made everything. So that's the word planted in your heart. That if you keep that word and you grow it, the word for healing, the word for prosperity, where it's going to come. It's going to come in the fact that God will show you what to do. He'll healing will just that's there. Prosperity, tithing, he gives you opportunity to tithe, to offer, and then he prospers the work of your hands. He gives you inventions. I was thinking the other day, I just love some of the inventions. I get this, well, this is neither here nor there, but it's an invention that people did. I get this callus on the bottom of my foot, the ball of my foot from like dancy ballet. And it it makes like a pebble. Have you ever had a callus? I mean, they're hard. They hurt. And then somebody made this marvelous invention. As CVS has them, Dr. Schultz. It's these callus pads that got this little tiny like band-aid you stick on the callus. It's got medication in it. And in a few days, it takes that callus off. Absolutely takes it off. And I used to go to the podiatrist to get it cut out, but now I just get that, stick it on for a few days and it takes it out. And I'm like, whoever invented that, that was really nice. <laughs> you know, it makes it makes it very easy. Somebody was given that beautiful idea by God, you know, and there's all kinds of things like that. You know, there's uh, hammers to put nails in things, you know, it's like you don't have to use your hand, right? It's like people invented amazing things from God. He gave us the seed. He gave us the seed of his word to prosper the work. He said, I, I've given you the power to prosper. I've given you the power to create. I've given you like Bezalel and Ohalab, Oholiab. That's in the house, in the tent of my father, but oh, 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 hell, the tent, uh, um, you know, Abba. But anyway, and Bezalel in the, Bezalel, the, the shadows of El of God, you know, and there they were in the tabernacle. And he said, I gave them skill. They were just making bricks, you know, for pyramids. And I gave them skill to engrave, to sculpture, to make the golden lampstand. Uh, I put my spirit in them and gave them skill. 
Well, today we're going to see getting skilled by imitating God as his dear children. Imitate him. That's how Jesus was so like the Father. Imitate him. Whatever he says, I'm going to say. Whatever he does, I'm going to do. That's imitating. Well, think about it. How do you learn anything? Play the piano, play the violin, do mathematics. You imitate somebody who's showing you how to do it, right? It's through imitation. And then eventually it becomes your skill. So if you imitate enough and speak enough like that person, you're going to become like them. That's how people become worldly, is they just watch worldly shows and say worldly words all day. They imitate and they become. You see what I'm saying? It's very important. Very important. Who you're going to imitate. Who you're going to think about. What you're going to think on. So the sun proceeds. For, well, we just said that. So let's see why I'm saying that. Let's read the scriptures. Tiffany, are you there to read for us? Is Martin with you or are you alone, Tiffany? Oh, Martin's here. Hi, Bonnie. Oh, hi. So we'll have Tiffany read the first and then Martin read the next two. Okay. So Tiffany okay. read the first one and Martin read the next two. Okay. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. John 8, 42. Thank you, <clears throat> Tiffany. That was beautiful. Go ahead, Martin. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. John 15, 26. Excellent. Now, judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. John 12, 31 and 32. Thank you, Mar Martin. Beautifully, beautifully read. And when you look at this, he's explaining the Trinity here. They proceed. God, Jesus is God's word. That word generated in him and became, that word was, in Hebrew, it's Debar, it's both word and thing. But that word, he is in him, he's thinking it, he's speaking it. And as he speaks it, the Holy Spirit brings it forth into manifestation, became the son. And, and the word took on human flesh with us and dwelt among us. It's that dream in God, generating what he is God, that word, you are your word. And there it comes. And, and then uh, the spirit coming forth, that's his deepest thoughts. That's his breath. That's his communication. And these are also so very amazingly beautiful. And then that, again, you see lifted up and drawing us back into, drawing us back into us, drawing us into him, into the father drawing us into that oneness with our creator. These these things are, what does it say, uh, Peter? Angels long to search into these. You know, the way that God deals with man. What is man that he is mindful of him? He's just made a little lower than God. But you see, God has the divine attributes and he has the power and he has, he's the source. But he shares his life, his characteristics, his nature with us and pours that in us that love so that we can walk as he walks in that perfect peace, in that perfect protection, that we can laugh at the devil when he brings us stuff. Say, oh no, I know God too well. You don't trick me into that. I don't get worried about stuff. You know, I just tell him no. You know, this week I tried to worry me about a lot of stuff and I said, wait a minute, no. That God's promise you're going to take care of that. You're going to take care of it. I don't need to worry about it. It's going to turn out really good. And that was that. So to know God, you got to look how he defines himself in his word and not to mere human tradition. Now he gives us apostles, he gives us prophets, he gives us teachers, he gives us pastors to grow us up and to the fullness of being like Christ. But then there's people that don't know him. This was the case in Jesus's day. The religious leaders were professing to be God's inner circle. And they were the righteous ones, the Sadiqim. They were righteous, but they taught the people incorrectly who God was. Jesus reprimanded them. He said, you're, you're hypocrites. You're putting lip service, but your hearts aren't there. You're lifting, you're putting these heavy burdens on people of the law and of tradition and of this, the very heavy burdens that if they don't exactly do that, they're lost. That's it. And other heavy burdens they were putting, if you read the Sadducees, which was the priestly class, they were saying there was no afterlife and no angels. And this is really bad when your religious leaders are telling you there's no resurrection. 
And that's why Jesus said, no, I'm the resurrection and the life. You know, everybody's alive to me. He's showing them there is resurrection. But, and he says, you don't lift a finger after you put this stuff on them. They're wandering like sheep without a shepherd. They're lost and they're sick and they don't know they can get healed. But he said, God's not like that. His yoke is easy and his burden's light. If you come to him in love and rest in him, you're going to take care of all that concerns you and lead you in the way you should go. And he said, somehow you got lost on that and you're leading other people's. He said, the blind are leading the blind. So he said, be careful. Um, and he, he said, this was the problem. So would you uh, read that for us? And, and, uh, but I know that this one, that why did the religious leaders not pass the test? Well, Jesus told you, what did he tell us? Anne? Are you able to read right now? She's in going in and out. No. Who can I get? Uh, I would like to read Sonia, Sonia, but I know you. But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. John 5, 42. I want everybody, thank you, Sonia, beautifully read, but I want everyone to pause right now. And I know you all have it because you came on this Bible study at, on the afternoon and Sunday and from Mitsuko and Yudi in Japan, it's like early morning on Monday. You managed all, you managed to get on here. So you got love of God in your hearts. But everybody think about it right now. Do you have that spark? Uh, like Laura was saying to me, you know, you can tell immediately if someone loves him or not, whether the spark is there. If they're just kind of like, uh, you know, we got to go to church. We got to do this. Got to pray. I didn't pray yet today. I got to read the Bible. You know, it's like, it's the difference between serving somebody out of a sense of obligation, responsibility, guilt, you know, and um, kind of complaining about all the time and saying how much you gave up and and then running after someone to serve them because just because you want to be with them and you just want to be around them. So it's like a joy test is first love. It's obligation versus, I mean, duty versus desire, like trap versus free, um, you know, obligation versus delight, guilt versus choice. And one is secretly weeping over their lot while another one is joyfully singing over their opportunity, you know? And um, one is complaining, the other is praising. One is saying how much they gave up and sacrificed to follow the Lord. You've heard that, the surrender at a sacrifice. And the other one is thanking God and magnifying him for the undeserved gain and treasure beyond measure that they got. It's like giving one penny for $8 billion, you know? <laughs> And then he's saying uh, the treasure they found in the field. And, and one is of the head and the other's of the heart. And uh, it's like duty versus opportunity. We have the opportunity to be with God. You have the opportunity to tithe and open the windows of heaven. You have the opportunity to give offerings. You have an opportunity. Are you going to take it and get blessed? And that's the problem with many leaders and many people today. They don't love God. They're in there. It's a profession. It's what they do, but they don't love him. And you can tell right away, but there's a lot of people to do. But before Jesus gave Peter the assignment to shepherd his people and be their pastor, what did Jesus ask Peter? Do you love me? That was the qualification for the assignment. Do you love me? And you notice he asked him three times. And I feel like but God was saying, you know why I asked him three times? One for the father, one for the son, and one for the Holy Spirit. Threefold love for the three in one. And I'm like, oh, I like that one. That's the first time I heard that. So I'm like, okay, I love your father. I love your son. I love your Holy Spirit. And I love everything you do for me. Don't you? The love all he does, the fruit of the spirit, the, the beautiful way our sins are forgiven in Jesus and we're made holy and our father. That he's like the father just waiting for the prodigal son to come back and have a party, you know? Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, now. This is what I'm going to talk about. Sonia, that was short what you read. Will you read this? Therefore, be imitators. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Uh, take note of that, a fragrant aroma. And we're going to look at some stuff today that this goes before God. And, oh, there is so much about this. There is so much about it. 
in the old and in the new, this aroma of Christ that goes up to the Father. So, but like this was the, I woke up the other day and the Lord said to me, the more you act like Jesus, the more you'll be like Jesus. I said, well, I like that. And then I realized that was from the Bible. Imitate God as his dear children and walk in love. I said, oh yeah, that's like Jesus. He certainly imitated you, Father, whose life was a sweet aroma to the Father. And now you who follow him and walk in love, spread that sweet aroma everywhere. Have you ever read that? So uh, let me see. Randy, would you read? But thanks be to God. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. Second Corinthians two fourteen through 15 Thank you, Randy. You should all be such a sweetness that comes in the room whenever you arrive. Yeah, yeah, there's some sweetness in here. What's that smell? But, uh, that's the oil of joy. Oh, the joy. <laughs> but um, what does it tell us? Your prayers rise up as incense before the Lord, and your hands lifted in praise as the evening offering. Now, here we're referring to spiritual sacrifice. And I'm going to go more into that evening offering in a moment. And that was David. He prayed that in Psalm 141 line two and it says it's a psalm he wrote while in a cave running away from Saul that means he could not get to the temple well the temple wasn't even built yet but he couldn't get to the the tent of the meeting or where the ark of the covenant was he was out there in a cave there was nowhere to offer for him the evening offering or the incense so what did he do he said my prayer and my lifting of my hands are going to do that because I am not there. And that's the spiritual sacrifice. And I want you to see, I, you know, when I looked at this today, I went off on another little line, what I want to take you on because it's so good. But this is from the book of Revelation where we see that not only as our prayer going up like incense before him, it's actually on the golden altar of incense that's in heaven. Remember, he told Moses, be very careful to, to uh, you know, exactly follow the plan I'm giving you because this is a plan from heaven. And we see in the book of Hebrews that there is that, and in Revelation, that there is that golden altar, altar of incense before the Holy of Holies where God is on the throne. And there is, uh, you know, this, the beauty of the tabernacle was brought to earth in a, in a shadow of it, but the real thing is there. So we see this golden altar of incense that our prayers are on. So would you uh, read that for us, uh, Vicki? And I saw the seven angels. Have I got Vicki? I know she came in. Sorry. Well, oh, there you are. Okay. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all of the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. Hand. Revelation 8, 2, 2 through 4. Thank you, Vicki. So beautifully read. Now you see here this aroma, this sweet aroma is going up before God. But I looked at those seven angels stand before God and it got me off on another tangent. And they're blowing the trumpets. So this is a, for your information note. Now we read in the book of Thessalonians, it, two times in the New Testament, it mentions archangels. And that... Um, in Greek is archangel, archangelos, which means a chief angel, an archangel. Only one is actually named in the New Testament, and it's Michael. And that's in Jude chapter 199. But in the Old Testament, there's certain angels that are identified with special missions from God. They're Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. 
And when Gabriel comes to, um, I, I want to, I want you to read this. We got the trumpet, see? You got the trumpet. But when, well, would you, Sonia, read this first? For the Lord himself will descend. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, indeed by the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Thank you, Sonia. So we see that trumpet, yeah? And then we see they stand, what was it say? There's seven who stand before God, and they get into trumpets there. And then look at this. This is when Zechariah, Gabriel came to Zechariah. Do you see something? Gabriel's identifying himself as one of the archangels, right? So would you read that for us? Um, Udi, Udi, Zechariah said to the angel. We got Udi? Sorry, come in. Uh, well, we go back to Tiffany, okay? Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands before God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Luke 1, 18 to 20. Thank you, Tiffany. Beautifully read. You see here, he identifies himself as an archangel. I stand before God. And what's interesting, though, is he told Zechariah, you're going to really ruin this by this doubt thing. I'm going to, God's going to make you quiet. You know, so because uh, at least Elizabeth said, oh, this is wonderful. God is acting on my behalf. And she had the baby and he's like, no, Jesus is coming now. We need John the Baptist to, to fulfill scripture. You're not going to ruin it by your mouth. So watch your words, you know. But isn't it wonderful that Lord, you know, silenced him so he didn't wreck it up. And then when he did get born, he his tongue was loosed and he spoke that beautiful prayer, you know, uh, about that the sun, the sunrise of from on high has visited us and that he would go before the faith, you know, the Messiah has come. So, um, but let's go back to the spiritual sacrifice and what we have. Remember Jesus released us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests unto God, our father and priests were the go between between the people and God. And they, they brought the people before God to intercede for them. They offered the sacrifices, the burnt offering, the peace offering, the guilt offering, the grain offering. You know, they offered the offerings that would bring blessing and pardon to the people and cover their sins until Jesus came and fulfilled every sacrifice and offering. But what does it say here that we're offering to God? Are we still offering the animal sacrifice? No, no. What does it say here? So, um, Ellen, would you read for me? And coming to him as a to a living stone. So he's the chief cornerstone. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as the spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. Thank you. So beautifully read, Ellen. And we know what those spiritual sacrifices are. We read it in the book of Revelation. They overcame Satan by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So there's your spiritual sacrifices. You bring the blood, you plead the blood and you put it on that altar in heaven. And it's already there eternally pleading for us. That's an eternal blood, eternal blood, eternal sacrifice. And you go in with your great high priest with boldness and confidence and you receive mercy for yourself and others. And grace, just when you need it, the answers. I say, offering, don't go in without Jesus, though. You know, you couldn't even go into the tabernacle of Moses without coming to the East Gate and bringing an offering. You had to bring an unblemished lamb or an unblemished bull, but you had to bring that sacrifice. And they put it on the bronze altar right at the gate. 
you you couldn't enter without the perfect lamb or the perfect bull. You couldn't enter. And once you did, then they examined your lamb. If the lamb was perfect, okay. You could put your hand on its head and all the single over there, and they would then slit the you would slit the throat of the lamb and the blood would come out, be poured on the altar, and they would um the burnt offering, they burn it, they'd barbecue it, in other words, until it was burnt to a crisp, and then they have the ashes. But we're gonna see something what God called that. But first of all, remember back to this. He said, the lifting of my hands like the evening offering. What's he talking about? Well, you'd know if you've listened to me for a while because we've talked about it. But um, there was a burnt offering of an unblemished lamb, the unleavened bread, and a hin of wine. And God commanded the priest in the tabernacle to do this daily. It's like daily church service, okay? They had the morning, vocare, and they had the evening, arav, burnt offerings. And that's why you see in the Bible that there was the 9 o'clock time and there was the 3 o'clock time the three o'clock hour of prayer and the nine o'clock. So when uh, Zechariah went behind the veil, it was probably, well, that might've been a feast of atonement. There it is. But you, you had the morning sacrifice and you had the evening sacrifice. And it was the uh, Ola, uh, Ola, the burnt off. Well, that's the plural, but Ola, the burnt offering. And um, what did they do? Well, they took a year old lamb, two of them every day. One lamb offered in the morning and the other in the evening twilight. And that was the three o'clock prayer hour that you see um, Peter and John going up to the temple for when they healed the lame from birth beggar at the beautiful gate. Jesus was crucified at nine, died at three. You see why? The morning and the evening sacrifice. And um, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour, the unleavened bread, and a hint of, of uh, oil was an oil on the bread. And a fourth of a hin of wine for the drink offering. So one lamb was in the morning, the other in the evening. And what does it make? What was it for? A soothing aroma and offering by fire to the Lord. Now you're going to see this continually, both in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, that every time they offer, and we're going to go back before, this sacrifice of the lamb for the sins and uh what happens it's this soothing aroma to the lord why you'll see that and this would be continual they had to do it all the time from generation to generation now they stopped it at certain times and they had problems but when they did this they didn't but thanks be to god jesus died once for all you know he's he's got it covered and um, he said, you're going to do this throughout your generations. Jesus made it perpetual at the doorway of the tent of the meeting before the Lord. Well, I'll meet with you and speak to you. What's the door? Jesus is the door. He's our door in. He's that sacrifice. And I will be consecrated by my glory. And I'll consecrate the tent of the meeting and the altar. And I'll consecrate Aaron and his sons. Now we're the priest. We've been set apart. We've been consecrated by the love of God, by the word of God, and I'll dwell among them. I'll be their God. He dwells in us now. And they shall know that I'm the Lord, their God, who brought them out of slavery, the slavery of sin and death, that I might what? Dwell among them. I'm the Lord, their God. And how could he dwell among them? Because of the blood of the lamb, because of that continual sacrifice. Why does he dwell in us? Why were we made holy and blameless and became the fragrance? That sacrifice. And what did it say? Imitate God as his dear children, just as Jesus offered himself for us, a sweet-smelling sacrifice to the Lord. Remember the end from the beginning. Uh, and you keep seeing that. Um, I'm going to have, in Hebrew, the word there is nikowak. And you see the nun and the yod, and you see that little, dot there and puts the I sound with the N sound. And then you see the het and the vav and the het. Now het is the first letter of ikta, of sin. But you see that nailed hand in there? And the noon is considered to represent the suffering servant of chapter 53 of Isaiah. He's bent over, you see, but it's a crowned letter. 
But when noon becomes the end of a word, like the resurrection, the bottom goes down into a straight line and he's standing up straight. Beautiful things you see in the Hebrew letters about Jesus. Beautiful things. And this is a quieting, soothing, tranquilizing. It took God's mind off the evil thoughts of man and saw the beauty of what Christ was making us, this aroma to the Lord. He smelled it all the way back to the time of Noah. I'm going to show you. And you will find this in all sin, guilt, grain, and peace offerings. They always say it's this soothing, it's this aroma. The Lord smells Christ. Now, all this is fulfilled in God's son and carried by you, her, in him. You're, you're going to lead others, people to the Lord by that sweet aroma of your anointing and of Jesus. He's the fragrant sacrifice. And as his body on earth, you have the same anointing as the head. And we know what that anointing is. It tells us in the Bible, old and new, that anointed as Messiah, Lord, King, and High Priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, the father anointed him with the Holy Spirit who appeared as Melchizedek. Neither father nor mother, like the Son of God forever. And the fragrant anointing of the oil is the oil of joy. So you can't help but be filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Say, I say, I'm filled with joy. I'm filled with joy. My head's anointed. I'm filled with joy. And um, say it. It makes you feel better right away. Now, see how it takes three and one. But I want to take you back to remember something. It should have jogged your mind already. Do you remember it was the sweet odor of the burnt offerings of the unblemished animals that Noah made when he came out of the ark that brought forth from God his promise never again to destroy all mankind, of which the rainbow was the sign and the seal? We're going to read that. And in the burnt offering, the Lord smelled the fragrant life of Jesus, for he knows the end from the beginning. And it says in Isaiah 54, 7 through 10, which comes right after Isaiah 53, which the whole chapter is about Jesus's crucifixion and him taking our sins, our pains, our illness away and bearing them for us and putting us right with God as the guilt offering. Sean, and then the next chapter said, these to me are as the days of Noah, and I've sworn to never be angry with you again. What were the days of Noah? What did he smell? He smelled. Yeah. Let's read that. Let's read that. Um, would anyone like to read? I'm calling on people that I, like, I don't know, but I'll take an offering who would like to read. Bon, I'll read. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay. Wait, put it where I can see it. And happy Father's Day to David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again smite every living thing as I have done. Genesis 20, 21. And it should be eight. I'm sorry. I forgot to put the, I mean, this is nine. Sorry. Put, put, no, it's, yeah, it's eight. Uh, I forgot. To, I forgot to put the eight there. There we go. Okay. 2021. Okay. Do Thank you, you Dorothy. Well, it was beautiful. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm going to have you read the next one in a moment, but I want to talk about that. That okay. Why did that, that soothing aroma from the clean animals that were going as a burnt offering? The burnt offering was the one in Leviticus, the first one, where the sinner would bring the lamb and put his hand on the head of the lamb, and all his sins would go over there. And then he'd slit the throat, the, the lamb died for his sins, and the blood would be placed on the altar you know splash, splashed all around and uh then they'd burn it until it was ashes and then take the ashes and put them on the east side of the altar in the sunrise and then they take them out outside the camp and release them sins of god you get beauty for your ashes and so that was this offering here that says the lord smelled that aroma and it tells us remember when we read ephesians 5 just now to imitate god as his still children and walk in love just as Christ, it tells you that that's that fragrance that we're carrying that tells God of his son. And we're in that. 
And so, so you know, you got to look at it. It's so beautiful. He knows the end from the beginning. That odor brought to him the sacrifice of his son. And that's why he said, I'll never be angry with you again. I'll never destroy you all again because the wrath fell on him. And that, I think that's so beautiful. Therefore, be imitators of God as his beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and offering and a sacrifice to God was a fragrant aroma. That shadow became a substance, but God knows the end from the beginning and that put him in mind, my son. Okay, go ahead, um, Dorothy, but since we are of the day. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. First Thessalonians 5, 8 through 10. Right. Thank you, Dorothy. This is good news, isn't it? That, you That's know, right. when he comes, whether you're still alive and caught up in the air or you already died and you're with him already, we're going to live together with him forever. That was that sweet fragrance. He gave his life as that burnt offering for us. And God smelled it all down the ages. Every time he saw the unblemished lamb, it's like, oh, that's going to be my son. And I am forgiving. And remember, this is a shout of the good things to come. Of course, it really happened, but it's in the Bible for a reason. A lot of things happen that aren't in there. Do you remember how um, Isaac was tricked into thinking Jacob was his first born? Remember, he put on Esau's clothes and Isaac smelled him. And he said, oh, the smell of the open fields is Esau, my son. The voice is Jacob's, but it sure smells like Esau. And then he put the woolly things on his arms from the goats and he said, oh, it feels like him. Well, what happens to us when we're baptized in, in Christ? It says, when you baptized and have your new birth, you clothe yourself in Christ. So what is the father smells the sweet aroma of the sacrifice of his son, making you worthy of the double portion blessing of the firstborn? That's what Jacob wanted from Isaac and also the blessing of Abraham and the promise of the spirit by faith in Jesus. You look like him, you're clothed in Christ, you feel like him, you smell like him. And the father says, that's, that's bon the voice is Bonnie's, but it sure, sure seems like Jesus. I'll let myself be fooled. You know, it's like, this is wonderful because we can live our life through him. But let's go back to what I opened with. Uh, Jesus imitated the father. And how did he do that? He only did what he saw the father do. And he only said what he heard the father say. Isn't that imitating? And you know, kids imitate their parents. I know. You know, if a kid knows some awful swear words when they're very little, you know where they learn them, right? And then remember, I got this one friend and they called her into school and they said, you got to tell your child not to say this. And she said, what is it? And they said it. She goes, oh, that's what I say all the time when I'm unhappy about something. And she thought, oh no, you know, so be careful about imitation and who you're going to imitate. And let's see what Jesus said about how he imitated God. So let's have, um, Grady, would you read first? Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. John 5, 19. Wow. There, now the next one. Father, I did not speak, or for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. John 12, 49, 50. Thank you, Grady. Now, 
Jesus came to die for us. That's true. But God also gave us the perfect example of how we imitate him. Because God is spirit. We don't see him. But we certainly see Jesus. And we know what he said and what he did. So let's keep on with this. So to conform, you conform to what you imitate. You really do. You conform to what you imitate. If a child is imitating their parents, they're going to be like them. Hopefully, they're good parents that believe in the Lord. And um, then you eventually perform like the one you're imitating. It's like if you learn how to play piano from somebody that holds their hands wrong in the position to play, guess what? You're going to do that too. <laughs> That's why it's important who you're learning from. So this is how people learn skills and progress to expertise. They make preparation by imitation until it becomes their own skill. Right? Yeah. As. And so how do you imitate God? Well, you can't see him. That's where the three in one comes into play in you each and every day. So what did Paul tell us? You know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Remember when Paul wrote that? Imitate me, he said, as I imitate Christ. So you see in God, it's three in one. That is, you see the various aspects of who he is, and particularly who he is to you. So you see how God operates and relates to you and all creation. He's your father, creator, sustainer, source, Lord, Yahweh, the one who is, who was, is to come, I am. He's outside time, he's in time, he knows everything, he sees everything, he's everywhere, and he's a person. He talks about his eyes, his ears, his soul. You know, he talks about himself. He's El Shaddai. We call that God Almighty. It means enough. He's more than enough for everything you need. You plug in him, you got everything. He's El Elyon. He's the most high. There's not, no one higher. He gives you life, breath, and being. All life comes from him in his continuum. He, all life is a continuum around him. He's the Lord of hosts. That's one way he protects you. He blesses you. He honors you. He prospers you. Every good thing given and every perfect gift comes from above, from him, the Father of lights. So don't be deceived when people go, why did God do that? He sent that. He did this. He did this bad thing. He did not do it. You got to watch out who you're imitating and who you're talking. Are you going to like the devil steals the seed so that you will not have dominion authority and he will take your authority and use it through you. And he he likes to destroy whatever God has made. And he's bent on destroying the people he uses as well. So remember, he's not your friend. Sin is not your friend. It will destroy you. So, um, Martin, will you read for us? Do not be deceived. Sure. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shift in shadow. James 1, 16 and 17. Thank you. Beautifully read, Martin. So God is watching over you, and he says he's making everything work, all things working together for good, when what? You allow him into your life by having a heart open to him in love. It's not he doesn't want to do that for everybody, but he's knocking at the door of your heart. That's like covenant. And you got to let him in and dine with him. Holy communion. You got you to receive that covenant and be in him and be in the Father. Then it's like you have no authority to act in somebody's life you're not married to the way you do with somebody you're married to. That's covenant. So in the son, okay, so we've seen the father. Now let's look at the son. You see the Father's work. You see him. Jesus is the fulfillment of all his names. The Lord your healer, the Lord your shepherd, the Lord your provider, the Lord your sanctifier, the Lord your righteousness. He brings us all that. And through him, we see the Father in action, but he is a person of his own, the Son. That word that generated in God, the Holy Spirit spoke it over Mary. You know, God spoke it over Mary and the Holy Spirit brought it into manifestation and the son, you see the father healing, providing, teaching, leading, guiding, correcting, perfecting, loving, forgiving, and above all, redeeming you from your sins by his blood. That was his job. And in him, the father makes you holy, 
blameless and without reproach before him. And it says he's the one that's put us in Christ and made Christ to be wisdom for us, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of you, the entire you, your spirit, your soul, and your body unto resurrection and eternal life. And it says he sealed us in him by the Holy Spirit and he's going to raise us up. He got to raise us up. Can't lose us. Once you're sealed in there, Christ has to see to you eternal salvation. Now let's look at the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, you see the Father revealing mysteries to you that have been hidden since before the foundation of the world. In the Spirit, he gives you revelation of his word, his wisdom, you know, hidden since the foundation of the world. He gives you his revelation of his word, wisdom, guidance to all truth, holiness. He teaches you things, love, peace, and joy. He reminds you everything the word. And by him, God pours his love, that is his denying nature, into your heart which is by the regeneration of new birth from above, by the word. And in within you, God has made a magnificent temple for his spirit. You're, if you could see your born again spirit inside, it's magnificent. And to live a, in, in you and fill you with grace endowments. That's the charisma, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We call it the nine gifts and the fruit of the spirit. And these are, he witnesses with your spirit that you're children of God, that your sins and offenses God remembers no more. He testifies to you. He witnesses with you. He gives you words and wisdom to say, if you have to testify about Jesus and he strengthens you, it's not by your might, not your power, but my spirit says the Lord within you that strengthens you, that powers you, helps you, counsels you, leads you. It's kind of too many S's there. Advocates for you, gives you answers, solutions when you need them. What a wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. And he's a person. And But remember, Jesus and the Spirit, where are they drawing you? Back into the Father. So they said, address God as Abba. The Holy Spirit cries out in your house, heart, Abba, Father. Jesus said, you say, our Father. He's my Father and your Father. My God and your God. I'm pulling you back in there. So don't get confused. Uh, when you love Jesus, the Father loves you because he sent him and he's in him and he's reconciling you. So the Holy Spirit lets you discern things as God sees them. Discernment of spirits. He gives you revelation knowledge. He gives you current, he, he tells you knowledge of things you couldn't know about people and tells you things to come that you couldn't otherwise know. And he lights that lamp in that's your spirit. That's that flame in you of the uh, anointing oil of joy and raises you up to eternal life. Do you see these wonderful things that that God is doing? And knowing who he is, how can we imitate him? How can we become like him as his dear children and walk in this kind of love? Well, we got to act like he does, but Job had a problem with that. He said, look, remember, this is so beautiful in Job. He says to God, how am I even going to talk with you you don't understand me, my weakness, the, the fear. You just don't understand it. You don't understand my flesh, your spirit. So how can we relate? Who's going to take those blows off me? Who's going to protect me? Who's going to understand you and understand me and put us together in a mediator? Who's going to do that? And God said, my son. <laughs> you know, I, he said, who put one hand on me and one hand on you so that I can talk to you in total fellowship and not fear? Who's going to do that? And then he knew it was going to be done because later he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And one day I stand forth on the just and I'm going to see him, God, with my own eyes in my flesh. So he knew there was going to come one like him. And God did this in Jesus. He's God with the Father, but he's man with us in one seamless, perfect like. And it says he was tempted, tested in every way we are, but it never got him. It never trapped him. It trapped Adam, who was, you know, he was created from above by the word. But Jesus, no. Why? He only said what the Father said, and he only did what the Father did. Also, do you remember when the Holy Spirit, we're going to do it the same way Jesus did, by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Do you remember the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at the Jordan River when he was baptized and remained? Now, you got to remember this. Jesus is God. But it tells us right in the book of Philippians that when he, when I come to do your will, O Lord, it's my delight to be the burnt offering, he emptied himself of his powers of God and became like us in everything but sin because he was born from above, not from the corrupted seed. 
So he had an eternal life in the flesh to give for the life we lost, a life for our life. He paid that debt and set us free and got us born again from above. But you have to know that he's the perfect example of how you and your humanity can be like God, who's spirit. So that you, what did he say? Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Follow me, follow Christ. He did it. So you're transformed by being conformed to the sun. So how do you become conformed? We said it before. How do you become conformed to the world? You act like the world. You wear what they wear. You listen to what they listen to. You imitate their morals. You do the things they say are okay. And you speak like them. And it's a culture and it's ideologies. But what does God tell us about acting like the godless world? Uh not too good. So, uh, Dorothy, you want to read again? Do not love the world. Let I get it where I can see. It. Okay. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. First John 2, 15 through 17. Thank you, Dorothy. So beautifully read. You know, here it says, don't be so in love with the stuff in the world. It's passing away. And, you know, it's going to pull you down. It's not going to build you up. And he said the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. It's just going it, to, it's... It's not from the Father. It's from the world. If you get us aside, oh, this is trendy. Oh, this is trendy. It's trending. You know, I'll tell you what's trending. The Holy Spirit's trending. You know, like miracles, signs, wonders. Let's get in that trend. Yeah. But uh, it's far above. It's way above. Getting full of the Spirit and and is so far above getting drunk. It's not even funny. But, you know, it's just so far above to be filled with the Spirit. It will give you joy. It will give you peace, give you patience. It'll give you all those wonderful things that you could just live on. And uh, Matsuko, will you read the next one? Have we got it? Not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans 12, 2. Thank you, Matsuko. And Jesus said the amount of diligence that you put into getting that word in you is going to determine your harvest, you know, 30, 60, 100 fold. So you see here, good, that's 30 fold, pleasing, that's 60 fold, perfect, that's 100 fold. So we want to go from the milk of the word to the meat of the word to the honey of the word. When it becomes so sweet to us and we can be strong, uh, then he, 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 God tells us he wants us to be conformed to Christ. That will transform us if we conform, if we take on his actions. So it all begins with imitating Christ. And what did he do? He spoke what God spoke. What did he do when he saw a storm? He said, quiet, be still. Stop it. And then he told the guys in the boat, where's your faith? Why didn't you do that? Why did you get so scared and let it toss you all over the place? And when he saw blind eyes, what did he say? Receive your sight. Jesus, you know, Jesus healed him. He knew the Father. He knew the Father. He knew the Father's will. He knew what the Father wanted. He wanted him to undo the works of the devil. And he went about very busy about it. Anybody that would have faith and let him do it, he'd do it. And he said, you do the works too. You imitate me. You do what I did. And even more, you get people born again. He couldn't do it. So, so the way you conform to Christ, you do it the same way you'd conform to the world. You would Im imitate his morals, his ways, his culture, his kingdom culture, his words and his teachings. Seeing him, you're seeing the Father. How's that? Let Jesus explain. Let's let's see what he said. Okay. Uh, Tiffany, will you read? Jesus said to him, How I have been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. John 14, 9 to 11. Thank you, Tiffany. Beautifully read. So he only said things in line with God's words. And he only did the works God showed him. You know, sometimes he thought a while before he talked. It, it wouldn't hurt if we do that. You know, think a little bit before we talk. And um, he was a hearer and a doer. James says, don't just be a hearer. Let it be a doer. So he knew that God's word was eternal life and he would speak nothing else. So how do you do that? The same way he did. Remember, as I said, though he's God, he became flesh and he dwelt among us and he emptied himself of those powers. He operated by the Holy Spirit, which is what we do. And what's the first thing the Holy Spirit did with him? Led him into the wilderness after his about to, and taught him how to answer the devil. Remember, I said he that led him into the wilderness, the Holy Spirit, he led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That doesn't sound too good. I mean, like the Holy Spirit's leading you out in the wilderness to, to tempt by the devil. Well, what was he going to do? This was this was boot camp. <laughs> he was teaching him, you got to answer. Every time the de devil gets after you, answer with the word of God. And that's where we got to learn too. And we have the benefit of knowing already, it, it, it's set out for us quite plainly, how that happened and how he placed chess three times and he was out. So, and we saw the kind of temptations gonna bring, the same ones that he did to Eve, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And he brought those three to Jesus, but Jesus didn't fall for it the way Eve did. She, she fell after the first check, she gave him one check and that was it. But Jesus checked him three times and told him now gone. Because why? He answered. You have to answer. I know that as an attorney. If somebody files something against your client that says he did this and this and this, if you don't answer, that you lose by default. you got to answer. And then they can take all your stuff. So and God tells us, my ways and my thoughts are not yours in the flesh. They're higher. But in Christ, the anointed one, in his anointing, he takes, he takes us higher. In him you died to sin. In him you were raised to newness of life. So born again. So what you're supposed to walk in newness of life, not in malice. Now, if you're thinking most of the time how much you can't stand someone and all the bad things they said to you, if you've been through a divorce or you, you know, somebody at work or your boss or whatever, if you're concentrating on that and not love, you're not walking in who you are. In fact, the Lord told me something the other morning that made me think twice. I would be concentrating on something, somebody, you know, the negative points on somebody. And he said, what you think about, you're going to become. Like, so don't think about how mean, hateful, and awful someone is because you're going to become that way. And I'm like, well, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And um, not in strife, but in peace, not struggling, but resting in, I, well, it put me, but it should be in the Father. I was taking it from my daily manna in the Father, in Jesus, and by the power of his spirit, his spirit within you. And no cursing should come out of your mouth, only blessing. Remember, James says it's not right. That you're putting foul water and fresh water out of the same mouth. You're blessing like God does, and then you're cursing your fellow man. No, you cannot do that. So what you do, I, I didn't change this part. Uh, so you, you can form your ways, uh, words and ways to, to, to God's ways. Well, I mean, you, you get it. Yeah. Well, let's just do like God is talking to us, because I didn't change this. I don't know why not. But, uh, God. but he, he never curses. He says, I never curse. I only bless. God, it's not going now. I never complain. I simply change things by speaking the truth in love. I never, this is God talking. I never speak what I do not want. God never says what he doesn't want. When it was dark, he didn't say, boy, it's dark out there. What are we going to do? I can't see. No, he said, light be. I tell the good end from the beginning and never change it to a bad end. You know, some of you start out like, I'm going to be healed or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And then when circumstances got in the way or it seemed not happening, you change your tune. He says, don't do that. Keep standing. He does not retreat from his plan. It says that the designs of his heart are forever. And it doesn't matter how many people go against his plan and try to stop the Messiah, or try, stop this, him being in the schools or the public. It doesn't matter how many people do it. He's going to win in the long run, but he doesn't give up. He, does, he still speaks the good end. It may take longer, but if you stay standing and don't retreat, he says, I'm not yes and no about my promises, they're all yes to you. So you can count on them. That's the thing you got to know. If God said it, you can count on it. Don't back down. 
because it doesn't look like it's happening fast enough. And God forgives. You got to realize that. We got to forgive because he forgives by the blood. And if you're saying the blood, you don't can't forgive somebody. You're saying the blood doesn't not enough. It doesn't pay you. It's your insurance. God will go out. It's like subrogation. God, God made you whole for whatever anybody did to you by the blood. And he'll go after the debtor like he, he did the Egyptians. But you have a choice every minute, every day, and every night. You can be thinking thoughts of blessing. And God got after me about this because I had gotten very negative about someone. And you can be thinking thoughts of blessing or cursing, life or death, love or hate, goodwill or malice, joy or sorrow, peace or agitation. You can see people as blessings or burdens. And your thoughts are going to determine what you speak. And whether you speak words of faith or fear, that's going to determine that. And what it's never going to change. Or whether, you know, don't say that. God's going to deliver. The words of purpose or idle words. What you choose for thoughts and meditation of your heart is what you're going to become. And it's who you are now. Where you are now is the result of what you've been thinking. If you are unhappy and depressed, you know what's the result of? What you're meditating on. See, no? And God gives us an answer. But it's like I just said, he's, this is very sobering. What he said to me, understand this before you spend your life consumed in negative thoughts about the behavior, character, and looks of others. In your life, what you think about, you will become. And I say, remember Jacob and the speckled and the spotted rods. Remember, God told him, put those in front of the strong ones when they mate, and they'll have speckled kids, the, the, you know, the goats, and the sheep would have speckled lambs, and they did. It was what they were looking at. So don't harbor thoughts of how fat, how ugly, how mean, or how hateful another person is. Instead, God tells you to raise your mind off that to where Christ is seated at his right hand and God is very precise in his instructions of how you do this. So let's all say, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. You know why? It'll give you such peace that passes understanding. It will make you into a happy person. I try. I did. Well, don't say try. I did. Yeah, I had to do it. I implemented this. I started saying, I love, I love that person. I love that person. And I thought about some good things. All of a sudden, I was so happy. I let go of that. That negative thing was really taking me down. And I let go of it and I got happy. And I'm like, ooh, this is happy land. So it's better than taking a tranquilizer. It's better going to a psychiatrist and pouring it all out and venting it. Because the more you vent it, the more worse it gets. So um, you need to just say, oh, no, you don't. I oh, know you don't. So would you read this for us? Um, Madeline, are you on, Madeline? Yes, Miss Bonnie. Yay, I forgot you guys came in. And I think Maria and Reggie are there too. And John, I got to call on you guys. Okay, go <laughs> ahead, Madeline. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made, to, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which sur surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Philippians 4, line 4 to 9. Oh, thank you, Madeline. Beautifully read. This is so full of instruction. But if you run your life this way, you will have heaven on earth. Because your mind will not be tormented. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul wrote from prison, I'm overflowing with joy. How could he be? Well, he knew he was doing what God wanted him to do. And he didn't get mad at God about anything. He was just so privileged, so happy to be, you know, it's not that easy. But he said, I have done this myself. I practiced it. I imitated it until I could do it. And he said, this gentleness, this reasonableness, this kindness in you, people should see that. Not that you back down from the truth. He wouldn't back down. He got thrown in jail but uh, for preaching Christ. But he, he said, not back down, but you answer gently. You are sensible. 
you are not, you know, angry, yelling person. The Lord is near. He's always with you, see. Be anxious for nothing. Uh, they say, well, I can't help it. I worry about that. Uh, I think you said nothing here. You know, you're not supposed to worry. So if you're a big worrier, it's time to say to yourself, no, no more of that. I'm going to obey God. How do you do it, though? You don't just say, I'm not going to worry anymore. Then you're going to worry. You have to do this. Go to God in prayer and petition, supplication. And you say, God, this is the problem. And I'm really not able to, I'm not overcoming it. You know, you got to give me your help. You're my healer. You're my provider. You will deliver me from any situation. You don't try me beyond my strength. I know all that. And this is what I need you, I need to work out. You tell them exactly what the problem is, whether it's a lawsuit at court or it's a threat against you or it's something at work or it's one of your clients or it's your family, or it's your husband, it's your wife, it's your kids, you know, it's yourself, it's an illness, whatever it is, you cast your care on him because he cares for you. And then you get a few. He's just in charge. Thank, Thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just put that person in your hands. You're taking care of it. You're going to work it out best for me and that other person. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to drive the nail in. I don't have to. You're going to do it. And it's going to show me how. I just rest in you. I lean on you. And I thank you for hearing my prayer and restoring what I've lost. And then it says that peace, that shalom of God, suppresses your understanding, will keep you from that agitation, will keep you from that fear, because He's there, and he's got it all in hand. And it will guard your hearts and your minds from torment, from addictions, from anger, from fear, from this nervousness, depression. And he said, finally, now this is what you got to do. Once you handed it all over to him, and you put it in his court, and he's helping you, he's showing you, he's strengthening you, you got to sing, you got to praise, you got to jump up and down. You got to forgive everybody. That's part of it, or they can not work. He can give you the answer, but it can't get in your door if you got all the bitter roots. But finally, he says, you got to change what you're thinking on. That's can't keep thinking on how awful it is and how much you don't like that one or how you're trapped or how you don't like your work or how you want to, you know, you got to stop just concentrating on that. You got to change your thoughts. And the best way is speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. So your thoughts of, no, you don't. I'm not going there today. I think about what's true. His word. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. He's my deliverer. He's my healer. He's my provider. And he is my seeding joy. And he's got heaven prepared for me. He's got me well in mind. His eye is always on me, you know, for, for good things. His plans for me are shalom and not disaster or for a future and a hope got great plans he's giving me the nations i'm going to be a prophet to the nations you know just go on and whatever's honorable well it's not real honorable to think degrading thoughts about other people god never does that about us no matter how much we have gone wrong he still sees us as precious whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is good repute any excellence he's saying think on those and he says that's what i do well, there's plenty of people going after Paul, trying to kill him, put him in jail, whip him, beat him. He says, no, nah, I don't dwell on those things. I dwell on my reward in God. And, uh, you know, the, Joseph had to do that when his brother sold him as a slave in Egypt. He had to just concentrate on the present and doing his best and walking with God. Promoted him way above his wildest dreams. So you hand everything to God in prayer and let him show you what to do and what to say. And then let him take care of you and the other person, whatever it is, and know that you can go out with joy and be led forth with peace. But you have to imitate Jesus as he imitated the Father. And you got to speak to those things. You speak to the illness. You speak to the mountains. You speak to the storms. You speak to the problems. Bills, you're getting paid. And every evil thing to take them down. And then you hand that restoration over to the Father for a good, peasy, and perfect result. He'll show you what to do. And the more joy and faith and peace you have about this, the better the result's going to be. The faster you'll get healed, the quicker those problems with finances will get resolved. I'm going to tell you something. I've had all those problems. I'm 71 now. I've had all those problems. And I have to tell you, the Lord is faithful. If you'll do what he says, 
But if you start saying, oh, no, I'm losing everything. I'm going broke. You just keep going down. Finally, owed a lot of money. But when I turned it around, the Lord had me out of it. I think in one month. And not from money falling out of heaven. The work he gave me. That was, I don't know how it happened. It was overflow. It was overflow. I even took a trip and went and studied Hebrew in Israel. It was overflow. And um, just got to turn it around by your word. And thoughts are seeds. And so are your words. And you'll eat the fruit of your lips. So think about it now. We're going a little over, but who are you imitating? The evil you see in others or the good you see in God? In seeing Jesus, you're seeing the Father. That's perfect imitation. And he told you how to know that by his works. And I'll kind of read towards the end because we're finishing. But he said, if I do not, he told, this is the way he told the Pharisees, I can prove to you, I am God. I am from the Father. If I do the works of my Father, if, if I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father's in me and I'm in the Father. He said, you see it by my works. So in seeing the Holy Spirit, you see the Father. How do you know? By his works. You don't see him, but when he shows up, you get revelation, you get inspiration, you get miracles, signs, wonders, and you see this in yourself and others. How do other people know you? Not just by your words, but by your works. How do you know others? by their works, by their actions. You know, people can give lip service, but the works prove whether it went in their heart. And Jesus tells you, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits, by their works. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. That's how you'll know it. If you're good inside, you can't produce bad fruit. So watch your thoughts. Watch your thoughts. If you're having malicious thoughts, you're going to produce malicious fruit. You don't want that. You're going to eat the fruit of your thoughts and your words. So he said, what happens to ones that don't bear good fruit? Cut them down. Throw them in the fire. So any thought you've got, cut it down. It's not right. Just cut it down. And you'll know by what it produces in you. Joy, peace, pain. You'll know where it's from. So what I'm saying is that you got to get in the law of faith because faith believes in the heart and speaks with the mouth. And um, he speaks with the S in the wrong place. He speaks the truth in love. So you you got to do that too. And I'm past time, so I think I better stop. But I was going to go through, uh, you know, some other stuff here. But I just want to say this. It says Jesus looking for faith. God's looking for faith. But what kind of faith? Paul says not feign faith. They're not looking for parrot pay. He's looking for something in the heart that's called, you believe, you know, well, just, just read this for us. Um, Reggie, we have come to know. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 to 19. Thank you, Reggie. That's the faith he's looking for. You know and believe in the love he has for you. And that gives you perfect confidence. He's never going to hurt you. He's never going to ask you to do something that is not right. He loves and he is love. And love gives, love blesses, love forgives. And he says, you know, well, we'll just finish with this one. Uh, would you read for us, Maria? But in all things... But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, lines 37 to 39. Thank you, Maria. This is so beautiful. Nothing. 
we overwhelmingly conquer because the creator of the whole universe loves us enough that he sent his side to die for us. And even though we can't even begin to imagine the vastness and the greatness of the kingdom of heaven, he says in Matthew 25 that he prepared all that for us. We love him. He made everything for us. And that's what the Trinity is all about. It's the way God serves us. He takes care of every one of our needs. Yeah. And you know, when you know and believe in this love that God has for you, you can, there's nothing can shake you or take you down. If sickness attacks you, laugh at it, rebuke it with God's word because you know who, you, who God is. He's your healer. And he loves you. And you know his promises. Financial, you laugh and rebuke it because he's your shepherd. And you have the wonderful privilege of doing tithings and offerings. Tithing and offering. And then fear, de fear, depression, anxiety, worry, anger, hatred. Those are unclean spirits that attack you. You laugh at it, rebuke it. No, I know who God is. He's love. And he's poured his love in my heart. Those aren't of me. They're of you. Devil, out of here. So that's that fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, jealousy, self-control. Oh, that tastes so good, that fruit. Tastes much better than hatred, anger, jealousy, malice, or ill will. Eh, watch your thoughts. Watch your thoughts. Those are not yours. As I told you, fire those employees that are ruining your inner business. So learn from the three in one how to be and how to see and you'll become just like God. Not his position, his role, and his divine attributes, but in character and purpose. So imitate God as his dear children and walk in love. And you, like him, will become love. And that's a wonderful way to be. So come share your master's joy. Now, I know I've got a little over, but I always like to finish with a song. So let's finish with a song. You did all the hard work. Now, think about it. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they do all the hard work. Well, first of all, he made the earth. He made us. He watches over us. He, he sees to all our needs. He feeds us. He shelters us. He clothes us. He shuns, shines on the good and the bad. He watches over us. He protects us. And we get Psalm 91 perfect protection. And he died for us. He died for us. And he counted as if we died to sin with him. And then when he raised Jesus, he raised us with him, sat us with him, and promised us resurrection of the body too, not just of the spirit. So he did all the hard work. We just come along, walking in the spirit. That's how we do it. And his life becomes our strength and our song. And he becomes our salvation. So that's often about, you did all the hard work. I just came along, walking in the spirit. Your life became my song. Your life became my song. That's the song of the lamb, right? Soaring with you on eagle's wings. You fill my days with beautiful things my life oh lord is a gift from you a treasure i cherish as you form me anew as you make me like you you did all the hard work i just came along walking in the spirit your life became my song your life became my song running with you by divine grace i fix my eyes on your shining face your son, O oh Lord, is a gift from you, a treasure I cherish as you form me anew, as you make me like you. You did all the hard work. I just came along, walking in the spirit. Your life became my song. Your life became my song, singing to you with joyful song. You fill my heart with peace all day long. Your grace O oh Lord, is a gift from you, a treasure I cherish as you form me anew, as you make me like you. You did all the hard work. I just came along, walking in the spirit. Your life became my song. Your life became my song. Sharing your love with me, O oh Lord, you make each day a precious reward. Your love, O oh Lord, is a gift from you, a treasure I cherish as you form me anew, as you make me like you. Does everybody sing? You did all the hard work. I just came along, walking in the spirit. Your life became my song. Your life became my song. Yes, your life is now my song. Yeah, sing to the king. Yeah. 
So uh, let's see, Ruth, are you there, Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He died for me. I believe you raised him from the dead. I confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me in that beautiful life you prepared for me in advance that I might enjoy it. Amen. Everyone said amen. Uh, oh, thank you, Grady. Now we'll stop the share. Okay, put up the shin for Shaddai. So happy you all joined me that we could celebrate our Father today in heaven. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and give you his grace. The Lord smile upon you and give you shalom. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Okay, Madeline, you're on. Madeline sings it for me in the morning. Okay. Miss Bonnie, I think I can only sing to the morning class. No, you can sing to the afternoon class. It's called obedience. Okay. Shalom, shalom to those far and near. Shalom, shalom to all who hear. Shalom, 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 shalom. Everybody, Shalom, tell her, thank everyone. you. Thank you, Madeline. We appreciate that. Okay, we'll stop the recording.